Would you please check your ideas and opinions at the door? All your philosophical and religious views, all your logic, because I say check it at the door advisedly because you can pick it up again when you go out if you feel unsafe without it. I'm not trying to argue you out of your opinions and views. I'm merely suggesting that for the sake of an experiment, you temporarily suspend it. Hello and welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast, an exploration of all things philosophical, alchemical, and esoteric. From the psycho-spiritual to the material-chemical nature of the all. Join me and my guests as we inquire into the liminality of mind and matter, and tend to the fertile soils of awareness and perception, while facilitating an expanded consciousness from the individual to the collective. If you enjoy the show and find it of value, consider supporting and becoming a patron via the Patreon at patreon.com slash philosophicalminds. A small contribution makes a big difference and definitely makes it easier for me to continue the show. Although, I will always do my best to keep it flowing regardless. Thank you all, and let's get into it. All right, we are here with musician, uh, father, family man, Freemason, film director, and producer of Illuminated and 33 and Beyond, Johnny Royal. Johnny, welcome and thank you for doing this tonight. Hi, Sky. It's uh, it's great to be with you. Definitely, uh, awesome name, by the way. It's it's one of those names. It's it's really catchy. Uh, it's kind of like Eddie Bravo. I don't know. If, do you know who Eddie Bravo is? Yeah, it's uh, it's not my birth name. It was a, a name I kind of stumbled onto from working in entertainment. So it's cool. It's catchy. Um. So I think for many people, uh, this podcast may lend kind of a perspective shift. I think we'll definitely dispel some of the myths and misconceptions and so on. And I think a good intro bit to open this up with will be, will be this. I, th- I think many people can understand that just because, you know, so one attends a church, for example, it doesn't mean that they are part of or in support of any abuses carried out by other members of the church leadership or priest, as we know that that has occurred. Similarly, there are elements within law enforcement or governments, and there's elements of those which are corrupt and they have abused their power, which is not representative of the whole. And just like all things that involve groups or humans, humans being you know humans and human being human nature being what it is uh there's bad apples and good apples so to speak and i'm saying this in particularly for any listeners that may have a freemasonic phobia i think it's mostly just fear of the unknown in that regard do you think i mean aside from like the illuminati offshoot and all which we'll get into but aside from that Do you think that, well, well, what is your overall assessment of people's general hesitation or skepticism around Freemasonry? What, as far as you can tell, gives rise to this sort of phenomena, like, of the stigma and all that? Uh, I think that any type of um, constraint or perception that is restrained by the human mind is because it is of uh, a lack of understanding or a fear of the unknown. When we look back through time, we look at different civilizations, you know, you go to ancient Egypt and to the Babylonians and Sumerians, the Mesopotamians, you know, there have been certain things that have occurred throughout human history that human beings have always been afraid of i mean the uh you know the rise of of these gods of nature and storm gods from you know these ancient times came from they didn't understand human beings at the time didn't understand you know well what causes rain what causes lightning what causes thunder you know what causes fire so they ascribed i think through a psychological perspective they 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 ascribed a way to digest and to find comfort 
and putting a face to the unknown, you know, when really these are, uh, we live in a day and age where, you know, we have all this technology and we can research things. And yet we still have, uh, in a platonic sense, people that wish to live in the cave instead of walking out to kind of see what else is outside and see the light. And, and as Plato mentions in, the, in his cave theory, that once they do see the light, they don't want to return back into the darkness of the cave because the light is the true nature of humankind. Uh, we are beings of light, even on a scientific level, when you think about it, that you know, what really uh, keeps us going is that our perception of reality is, is uh, dictated in a sense and controlled by the mind, which is nothing more than an electrochemical storm of, of neurons and uh, different pathways of the brain firing off of synapses. And, you know, so it's, it's electrical. That's something that that's a great mystery that we still have to understand uh, yet to understand. But when we look back, um, what's really fascinating to me is when we look back at ancient Egypt, and if you look at the papyrus and you read the book of the dead, you know, the, there's this misconception that the ancient Egyptians pack practice these, these mystery rites. Um, and that is to say that, you know, which is different than the Mithraic rites of Mithras or the Eleusinian. Um, but the Egyptians practiced funerary rites because to them, they needed to understand these methods in terms of magic so that they could be guided in the underworld. And when they got to the chamber of Isis and Osiris, uh, led by Horus, uh, you know, their son, who is half dead and half alive to the scales of divine justice. At the scales, they had um, there was a demon that was sitting there with a, the head of a crocodile and the bottom of a hippopotamus. Now, why would why would you why would you connect these two different types of animals together to represent something? Well, in that story, which also ties into Freemasonry, it's, it's part of one of the degrees in, Masonic, uh, uh, in the Masonic mythos, that that demon was sitting at the scale because if the heart of the deceased weighed more than uh, a feather, meaning that uh, they did not have, they did not lead a good life or a moral life or a life in accordance with their their God's divine law as they perceive it at the time, that that demon Mat would consume the heart and they would cease to exist. So their version of hell was just non-existent. And now if they passed the test, they would pass into the chamber of Osiris and they would become a part of light and become a part of the sun, which gives life back to, to earth and to all things. So essentially, I think that when you look at Freemasonry, it's such a broad broad subject. I mean, basically what Freemasonry is, is that, you know, we have these, these little generic one-liners like, uh, and, and it's not discounting that they're not true. Like uh, it makes good men better and it's progressive moral science. Those, those things are all true, but on a, on a broader perspective, Freemasonry is a course of study of human evolution and the psychology of the human mind by utilizing various mystery schools of philosophy and religion to teach lessons of moral aptitude so that, in fact, you can become the best version of yourself. And, you know, this is no different than many aspects of, of psychology where you're, you're going inward to find your ego because the ego is supposed to act as a defense mechanism. It's, you know, it's there to protect you in a sense, but the ego is not the one in control. You are the one in control. And you have to remember that as you're going through this journey. Now, there are different things that have happened throughout the history of Freemasonry that, you know, give rise to these different conspiracy theories and, and misconceptions. You know, the, um, there's, there's the two, two of the more popular ones are, you know, the the man who infiltrated uh, a Masonic lodge in the 1800s. And, uh, you know, he was supposedly killed by other Masons and, you know, the, none of that really has any weight to it that uh, in history. And another one is Albert Pike, who was a, 
he was the grand commander of the Scottish Rite in the uh, mid 1800s. You know, his he rewrote the what are called the higher degrees of Freemasonry. So these are degrees four through 33 based off of the old French manuscripts. And he thought it was very important to study as a Freemason etymology, which is the study of the nature or origin of words. So uh, one of the words that he talked about in his book, Morals and Dogma, was the word Lucifer. So um, people get this misconception that you know, uh, Masons are Luciferian, that uh, we worship Lucifer. Um, but when we're, in reality, when you, you know, when you take a look at something such as the word Lucifer, and before I get into that, it's the same thing, you know, what Hitler did with the swastika. The swastika was a very, very positive symbol. I mean, if you look at Rudyard Kipling's books, some of his books, and, you know, this is before Hitler's time, there's the swastika on it because it's, it's, it was a symbol for good health and healing and understanding, enlightenment. And Hitler understood that symbols are powerful. I mean, even to this day, I mean, the flag of a country, people will die for it, right? So, and that's a symbol. We have all these different symbols, and symbols are powerful because they contain within them some aspect of universal truths. So, with regard to these misconceptions around Freemasonry, um, you know, when we look at, you know, Pike, when he was talking about Lucifer, and he talks about, you know, oh, how strange a name it is for the light bearer. Because, you know, Lucifer, uh, when you translate it from latin it, it literally translates to light bearer light bringer and there are um you know at the vatican when they refer to you know there's there's mass uh, and you can look this up on online but there's different uh times that they hold mass and they're referring to christ as the bringer of light and you will hear the word lucifer in the vatican you know you know oh lucifer and they'll sing to praise to Lucifer because it's the actual, it's the proper word to describe the light bearer. Now, as the Bible gets, you know, kind of put together during the uh, early fourth century common era, all of these words start getting kind of thrown around and, and mixed up because we're going from languages of Aramaic and, you know, all kinds of different dialects and, we have these different terms that are introduced combined in their own. We have Lucifer, we have Satan, and we have the devil. Now, Lucifer, as we know, is a, a Latin word, which means light bearer. Satan is a Hebrew word, which means the accuser. The devil is something completely else, sub, completely different. It's a completely separate. You know, and the, the people that are listening to this, they can do their own homework on, on these different things. You know, it's all out there. This is, this is an information. Um, another thing that gives rise to these misconceptions about Freemasonry is the secrecy behind it. Um, we don't keep, there are aspects of the ritual that are secret. There are aspects, which we call esoteric, uh, knowledge for the few. And there are other aspects that are exoteric, which are, anybody can know them. So the reason why that that is done is that it, it imitates ancient initiatory systems. And these ancient initiatory systems or rites, even the Essenes, the early, early Christians, Christianity at a time was a secret society. And people forget that. Because it had to be. Because if you were caught in Rome practicing Christianity you know, around the time of, of Christ, uh, you were executed or you would be, you know, or... Genocide was committed by the Romans, you know, and um, or to Christians. And so people forget that you know, even, even these, uh, these early, early religions were secret. Uh, Judaism as well, too. Um, you know, you have the secret mysteries of the Kabbalah and the Sefer Yetzirah and, you know, all of these different kind of secret teachings. But they are secret. Um, for one of two reasons, uh, or both. One is that it's, there's a necessity for the survival and the protection of the people practicing them. 
But two, and, and, and which is the majority that I believe, is that they are kept secret because uh, just like anything in life, any type of craft that you will take on for yourself, whether you're a carpenter or a mathematician or a philosopher or um, a geologist or whatever it is, knowledge is, is progressive. So you can't, uh, you know, you look at mathematics, for example, you can't go from basic addition and subtraction to nonlinear algebra or linear equations or, or Boolean algebra or abstract algebra. You have to understand the basics and the fundamentals of these methods of knowledge to progress. So one of the first lessons that you're taught in masonry is secrecy and silence. Um, and you're taught that for two reasons. One is that um, it's a lesson in morality. So you're being taught that you need to keep these things secret because we are testing you to see if you can be a true and trusty friend, a true and trusty brother. If someone comes to you and says that I, I, you're the only person I trust and I need to tell you this. And I, I shared the secret with you and it's a very serious thing. It could be a very, a life or death situation. And if you go and run your mouth to it about a bunch of different people, I die from it, then you're, you're not to be trusted. And, um, you know, and, and 33 and beyond the film that I directed about Freemasonry, Dr. Jim Tresner, the late Dr. Jim Tresner, you know, he talks about that. He says, why would you ever trust someone again that, that repeats what you say? Why would you do that? If you do, that's your own fault. That's your own downcoming. And that's your ego. Your ego is interfering with it, which it gets, you know, deeper down the road. So a lot of these misconceptions come from, you know, these, these kind of catchphrases that are thrown around misunderstood like the word lucifer well uh, to to break it to everybody in the world i mean you know if if you're not studying um you know if you practice if christianity or judaism or islam or hinduism or you're zoroastrian or whatever it is that you are if you're if you're not if you're not really practicing and not taking it, taking it upon yourself to do the work of, of trying to understand what these lessons are teaching you, then I, I would say that you fall out of the definition of what you are ascribing to yourself as being a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, a Hindu, or a Zoroastrian, or, or whatever it is again. So um, that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. And, you know, these secrets get deeper and deeper because we get to you know, these different things, which we call ineffable. Uh, and it means not to be spoken or incapable of human uh, or, or, or being incapable of, of actually being spoken. So for instance, I could ask you, you know, do you love your mother? And, you know, you could say answer yes or no. Most people are going to say yes, probably, you know, and I could say why. You know, so there's only so far that you can go with human language because even human language, words are symbols for constructs of thoughts of the human mind. So that's, that's my response to like, what, where do these misunderstandings come from? Because it is a very deep rooted system of philosophy that kind of combines all of these different uh, philosophies and religions together. And it takes the best parts of them and it teaches the candidates or the initiates going through these philosophical grades how to be the best version of yourself and how to seek out and find and discover what you truly are. Because this what what our appearance is, this body, this is not what we truly are. I mean, they're, you know, they're, I always call them spacesuits because when you think about the big picture, we're on a rock that's that's revolving around an invisible tilt uh, or visible axis and it's going and it's floating around a nuclear bomb basically and and space you know and there's really you know w which direction is up and down once you get out there 
So, so we're here and there's this invisible force called gravity that holds us to the earth. These things are very, very, very abstract the higher that you go in your understanding of Freemasonry as within any other initiatory system like the Golden Dawn or Hermeticism. You know, they become more and more abstract and they become more secret because besides the secrecy of morality, of being able to trust your, your brother in Freemasonry, um, you know, or, or for female Freemasons or, or their sisters, you literally get to a point where it's nearly impossible for you to communicate in human words what these things are because they become such a personal experience to you. Yeah, wow. I think that those are, you hit the nail on the head. Like those are some of the most important responses in terms of things that are often referenced, like the the Lucifer thing. And, you know, I, I think that was a beautiful response. Um, I do want to say, I mean, I can kind of see both perspectives now within all of this. And, you know, mentally I do kind of relate a little bit to the conspiratorial minded individuals. And, you know, I can actually understand like to a certain degree, certain perspectives, it can be a real chore these days to kind of find the truth of any, anything and constantly being bombarded with propaganda on a daily basis on top of it. Cause it's, it's been clearly de demonstrated at this point with like the legacy media and the messaging that's being put out there. It doesn't always necessarily align with the reality of things. And, Furthermore, it's been demonstrated and verified that some governments actually have been known to create divisions and agencies dedicated to experimentation on their own civilian populations. I mean, you know, here in America, the CIA alone in particular, you know, like the MK Ultra Mind Control projects, that, that was an actual, actual reality. So I can kind of see somebody from the outside they have all this information and they're looking at different connections and trying to kind of make sense of things. And they're like constantly being lied to on certain levels. And, you know, whether, whether it's by, you know, particular leadership that's aimed at gaining power acquisition or for financial greed or for more influence, and then people on the outside looking at these institutions and systems trying to make sense of it all. But I think the problem lies mostly in the communication barrier when people are afraid to sit down and have a conversation like we're doing right now. And I think the antidote is it's in what you've done with these films and in terms of highlighting things from an informed perspective in such a beautiful way, as well as just you know having transparent discussions openly so long as we live in a society where free speech is allowed to exist, I think these days that's kind of like a, a subject of interest as well with the whole freedom of speech thing. I think we're starting to learn how important that is. But systems like Freemasonry, as at least my perception now has come to see, it seems like those are very much so supportive of that notion and very complementary to these things. So I just thought that that was, that was interesting. It's interesting that we have a large group in the population that they operate in this mindset where they're, they're trying to figure things out. It's very easy, easy to become conspiratorial minded and to jump to certain conclusions yet the when you come around to it and you look at things a little bit deeper you start to investigate you come to find that these systems are actually supportive of the very thing that they're trying to point out in some sense if that makes sense does <laughs> i think that uh, the one thing that i would encourage people uh, to do that are on this conspiratorial path. Um, you know, you mentioned the CIA, there's a lot of other agencies, um, you know, out there. I mean, the, the question becomes, you know, does it really matter? Because 
Aristotle said that the ultimate goal and he, in his study, Nicomachean ethics, he said the ultimate goal of a human being is to reach eudaimonia or a state of happiness. But there is a state beyond that, um, which is a state of equilibrium where there, uh, you know, that's what the, uh, uh, the Buddhist monks try to reach is the state of oneness with divine conscious of the universe. And that's been my experience with it. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not saying I'm a Buddhist, but my, my higher power, my perception of God is a universal mind, a universal consciousness that, you know, I got to meet the Dalai Lama when I was in college. And I remember uh, he said something to me, and I was asking him about, you know, like, when do you know that you're not on the right path, basically? Like, if you're in the wrong job or, you know, if you're so unhappy. And he said, that which disturbs your peace of mind is not worth pursuing. So, you know, I think that this stuff with the CIA and MK Ultra mind control, has, have governments done an ethical, immoral human experimentation i mean yes that goes back to the dawn of civilization you know i mean there the question becomes you know is there really such a thing as good and evil you know when you look at that from a universal perspective and i'm not saying that uh there aren't moral and immoral actions in the world because there definitely are but they are human constructs. So, for example, if a comet smashes into the Earth and it kills all life on Earth, the comet isn't evil. The planet isn't evil. It's, we're just in its way. So the people that obsess over these conspiratorial you know, things, and they're trying to find these answers, you know, all they're going to find are more questions. You know? And Heidegger kind of outlined that, outlined that in a book called Being in Time about uh, is a study of ontology, which is the study of being itself. But the the more answers that you unveil, they're revealed for new revelations, and the mysteries of philosophy and and religion do that as well too. Um, they're revealed because that's just the nature of things, you know. So when you look at governments and things that they do, do they do things that are immoral and wrong? Yes, absolutely. Can you trust them? More than likely not. Not not fully. I mean, I don't personally, but I, I am a patriot of the United States of America. I believe in the Constitution. I believe in freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. I believe in the right to bear arms. I believe in all of that because I think that those that document is one of the most profound and important documents ever written in human history because it, it, it asserts that and you're speaking of the Constitution, is that correct? Yeah, the Constitution that all men were created equal. Now, other people might say, "Well, we'll look at the people who who, who forged that document." Well, I can say, "Well, okay, well, let's look at Henry Ford. Henry Ford, you know, with the Ford automobile. Um, Henry Ford was a known racist, a known anti-Semitic, but does that mean because of his personal choices and?" his ignorance that we should throw away all the technology that has been created from Ford Motor Company? Do we erase history? No. History is there so that we can learn from it and we don't make the same mistakes twice. You know, tearing down monuments of these different things and all this, like, I think it's just total shit, to be honest. Because those things are there and they are erected for a reason, which is to remind us of how feeble and how quick the danger of the populace of the human mind can fall from intellect into mere animal reasoning, herd mentality, which is called the mob. And when you set the mob loose, we devolve into chaos. And we're not, we're not beings of chaos. We are beings of order. But no matter what way you look at it, spiritual, religious, or scientific, you know, there's order within our structure. There's order within the, the book of nature. Uh, masonry re regards the nature as how God reveals itself to us to emulate nature. And the most important thing uh, is, I agree with you, is being able to have an open dialogue. And I haven't seen that for quite some time. You know, I think the founding fathers, when they talked about the right to assemble peacefully, 
there's no such thing as a peaceful, peaceful protest. There's just not, you know, you can have the best intentions on either side, but there's just, there's not, there's not a peaceful protest because you're going in with all this hypercharged emotion instead of using intellect and reason and, and balancing it with morality. So I think they were talking about going into town halls and meetings and having and debate and discussion about things because lo and behold, I mean, wow, maybe, maybe we might actually learn something from each other. Maybe, maybe if we're on total opposite ends of the spectrum, you believe one thing, I believe one thing uh, to be true. And again, truth and fact are not the same thing. Just because you believe something to be true does not make it fact. And same for, that goes for me too. Just because I believe something to be true doesn't make it to be, doesn't create a fact. Facts are indisputable. However, dialogue is key and, and people need to start talking with one another again and open a dialogue because if not, this country, uh, you know, it, it can fall. All great civilizations, all empires rise and fall. And I would, I would rather see, you know, this country uh, turned around and a dialogue begin, a, a, a peaceful dialogue. There's no reason. You know, when I see people that are angry out there shouting about things on either side of the political spectrum, it, anger is a secondary emotion. And if you, if you can, if you recognize that anger is a combination of fear and or physical or emotional pain, so as soon as I see someone that's angry or pissed off about something and they're, they're shouting at someone's face about, oh, well, you know, we should take away guns or we need, uh, we need to impose all of these mandates uh, for this virus that we still know really nothing about. You know, I mean, even the intelligence committees are still going back and forth about where is the origin? Where did this come from? You know, um, you know, was there gain of function research from the United States? Probably. I mean, that's the games that the intelligence communities play. But does it does it matter? What matters is that, you know, how we live. And Masonry, we're taught that one of the most important things that you can do as a Mason is to overcome the dread of death so that you can live a full life. And once you accept that you you will die someday it changes your perspective and you really come to terms with one day i'm going to leave this earth and i'm going to move on in some form or another whatever that is uh it, it will if it really impacts you it will it will want it will create a wantonness in you to be kinder to people to have compassion um to be more balanced to know when to hold your tongue and to know when to speak up, to know when to be peaceful, and to know when you have absolutely no other choice than to go than the fight. But dialogue is the key to all of it. Amen to that. Yeah, definitely. And just let's just take, you know, the notion of freedom of speech for example. I think that parallels nicely with. I don't remember the exact degree. I think it may have been the 30th or 31st in, in the film 33 and Beyond. And an aspect of this degree, I think it was described by by somebody as revolving around the idea of I may be completely repulsed by the ideas or thoughts of another individual's uh, perspective, but regardless, I'll absolutely defend your right to say it. And I just love that so much, and I think it's so important and can't be emphasized enough. I just, uh, that notion alone, I have like a lot of respect for, and I think that these are important points to touch on. So. Absolutely. That was uh, Dr. Jim Tresner as well, too, the late Jim Tresner. And that's in the, you know, part of, part of the underlying thir philosophy of the 31st degree. Uh, the mythos of that is the divine justice, and the aspect of divine justice is that. We're all created equal. So even though, and he says that, um, you know, do you believe in, you know, free thought, free speech? How much do you believe in that? Do you believe in it so much that even though I absolutely despise everything you are saying, I will absolutely defend your right to say it. 
you know, like that is, that is, that is honor. That is wisdom. And that is a universal truth. That is a universal truth that my hopes are that maybe one day the world will evolve, transform one into it because people don't, people don't change. People stay the same or they transform, you know, and it, it just, it goes back to dialogue. It goes back to sharing, you know, our thoughts with one another on a peaceful vibration, a peaceful frequency. Yeah. hundred percent. So, so I watched both 33 and beyond as well as illuminated. And I thought they were both excellent, very well done. I think you're a master of your craft in that regard. And it's so interesting because the night before I watched, uh, the first film, I was having a conversation with my roommate and she was doing dishes and we were just talking and she goes, I actually kind of like doing dishes. And I'm like, okay, lunatic, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> I was like, I guess I'll just start saving them for you then. But she explains why, and she said, it's kind of like a sort of meditative reflection or something. I'm looking out the window at the horses and the sunset and thinking about my grandmother or my great-grandmother, and they might have been doing the same exact thing and what their lives were like when they were doing this motion that I'm doing right now. And I'm like, whoa, that's actually very profound to think about because through particular acts or rituals it's essentially like kind of tapping into some ancestral memory so then i watch i'm watching the film and you know the different degrees and rituals and it's like something clicks and i'm like this is that same shit going on to an extent but with deeper meaning and intention behind it and i can really see the power and potency and the effect that this could have on the psyche. And up until then, I just never really considered that. And I think you did a really great job at conveying that message in the film. I don't know if that was an intention on your part, but definitely it struck me in that way. And that's kind of like one of the the things that stood out for me. What, what I, I like the story about uh, your roommate washing the dishes because what people don't realize is, you know, Joseph Campbell, uh, who is an author and you know, basically outlined the hero's journey, which all of these, you know, modern films kind of follow like Star Wars and the Marvel films and like, you know, a, mo a lot of films out there follow like the hero's journey, the, uh, you know, even Tolkien's, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings. That is a ritual she's performing. And uh, Campbell would say that, you know, the, uh, one of the things that you must have in your life is ritual experiences on a daily basis to live a full life because it allows you to reflect when you take a shower or you get out of the bath, you know, um, on a deeper level. Um, and this is something from uh, production that we just finished this TV series. The hermeticist would say that, um, you know, when you, if you, if you look at ancient times, like the taking a bath was a ritual to these, the, you know, ancient gods of the water and, you know, drying off or, you know, like that's a praise to the air and becoming warm is that's a praise to the gods of fire, you know? So like there are these old, old, old elements and these daily things that we do that people just skip over. But, you know, the, the, the ritual is very important and people don't realize that they have the rituals or they call them routines, but they have meaning. I mean, you know, the person that listens to the same song on repeat that drives an hour to work every day, you know, that's their ritual because it's, it's taking them to a place within themselves that creates peace and harmony. And naturally, that is what the universe wants for us. That's what we want for ourselves. You know, the Illuminati, that was a, that was a very challenging and interesting project because, you know, we, we, you know, we got a hold of, you know, it, it was Joseph wages. It was a very good friend of mine. He wrote a book called the secret school of wisdom. And in that book, it has the English translation of all of the Illuminati rituals. And, uh, you know, so the conspiracy community refused to believe 
that the Illuminati no longer exists. My retort to that is read the rituals because it's like sitting through a nine hour ontology class of philosophy. So there's these politicians, they don't have time to do this stuff, you know, and, and the rituals, you know, basically they are, they're a lesson in, in ethics. They're a lesson in epistemology and metaphysics. It's classical philosophy. The only difference is, is that the Illuminati, you know, Weishaupt, uh, founder of the Illuminati, um, he was ver- raised in a very p- peculiar way, in a very particular way during his time, you know, in the 1700s. And, you know, his, you know, I want people to watch the film, so I don't want to, like, spoil the, what, what the story is. But, um, you know, he was raised non-Catholic when most of Europe at that time was predominantly Catholic, you know, he becomes the first professor of teaching canon law or, or law of the Vatican Catholicism at the time. And uh, he's non Jesuit. So he's the first non Jesuit professor of canon law at this university. And his, his idea of starting the Illuminati, you know, like, the other, uh, you know, names they were looking at was like the Order of the Bees, you know, but the Illuminati, it's just so catchy. It's such a catchphrase. It's, you know, I mean, it's like kind of like viral marketing 101 all the way back to the 1700s. And it, you know, continues to exist. And people confuse like these different signs, like when they see like the sign that Jay-Z always does with his eye and the triangle made by the hands. That's actually a a hermetic sign that means fire, you know, in verse it's water. And, um, you know, you have air and earth. And um, so, you know, these artists and musicians in pop culture, they, 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 they perpetuate this, this thing that only lasted for 12 years in the late 1700s, this group, which was, uh, you know, it's, if you watch the movie dead poet society with Robin Williams, I mean, that's essentially why he started the Illuminati. It was, it was to teach enlightenment era philosophy, which was banned by the Catholic church at the time. Yeah. Tupac was great and all, but he really threw us off track with this one. Didn't he? (laughs) The Illuminati want my mind, soul and body. (laughs) Yeah, it, it goes to show the power of two things. One of, again, you know, kind of inverting symbolism in the teachings of philosophies. And then two, you know, I mean, basically not knowing or not or having a lack of knowledge thereof about a particular subject matter. You know, we were, we were talking about government stuff before. It's like the, the Department of Defense Pentagon and the CIA, like there's tons of stuff out there that's actual official documentation of minutes and proceedings that you can read. But people, people would rather. The former CEO of Netflix said, a long time ago, he said that the, the platforms that will win the content wars are the ones that make it most convenient for the consumer. And people are becoming lazier and lazier and lazier. People don't want to do their own research. They'd rather turn on the news and. You know, whether it's CNN or Fox News or whatever, you know, NBC, they'd rather have someone spoon feed what's going on in the world to them with opinion mixed into it. You know, well, I don't want opinion. I want fact. I want to factually know what is going on in the world. So when I want to learn about something, I will go directly to the source and one of the best things I heard about doing research, about finding fact, when I'm talking about truth, finding facts, things that cannot be disputed, is to be dispassionate about being passionate. So I was passionate about the Illuminati when we started this project. I was like, oh, I'm going to find these amazing secrets, maybe, you know, like, but, you know, at the end, what I found is I was, I was a little bit disappointed because I was just like, these it was just a group of people that they wanted to teach full certain uh, areas of philosophy that were banned by the Catholic church. And, you know, they grafted themselves on the Freemasonry. Yeah. I mean, 
honestly that there, there's a lot about Weiss up I actually admire to be honest mm-hmm. um and I'm curious I think it was maybe like the ninth degree or something it had something to do with choosing liberty and freedom over riches or something along those lines I know most of the rituals I think were kind of some of them were a little bit boring but um there was one that in particular that really stood out to me and I actually I was like, that's, I like the message of that, to be honest. <laughs> but And then I think people just don't often consider the context of the time that this was all going down in because, you know, the circumstances that he was faced with in terms of not being able to, uh, or uh, essentially being sort of shwayed or pushed away from reading particular texts and he basically was like, screw that, I'm going to read everything there is and make up my own mind about things. And I, I, there's a lot of that that I actually relate to and I really like. Yeah. So you uh, traveled to Bavaria for the film, and I was kind of just curious. I wanted to ask you a little bit about what that experience was like. I mean, it was incredible. Uh, the people that we met with over there were very very brilliant people there's there's a very active community of academics in different universities that are you know actively researching the illuminati uh you know two of the gentlemen in the film you know talk about that and they you know that's their life's work because you know what's interesting is that you see this uh, Dr. Olaf Simmons, who's in the film, he created, and he's still working on it, I believe, but with not Wikipedia, but Wikimedia with the software he was using at the time. What he was doing is creating pinpoints where all of these letters of the Illuminati correspondence were found, and they went all the way as you know far south as Italy as that I could see. <laughs> and um, you know, and we were joking about it because he was like, you know, we're. I was thinking too. He's like. I, find something great like this great secret like it's being passed on but you know you had people that uh you know when they were exiled from bavaria the illuminati you had them uh, you know some that ended up in italy and different parts of europe and they were writing to other members of the illuminati asking hey do you know anybody here i'm looking for a job you know basically you know like these are the things like they were looking for and and you know, we kind of put them on a pedestal because of pop culture, but they were just, they were human beings that were um, seekers of, you know, different types of knowledge. And, uh, you know, Vysopt, I think he was a very brilliant, very brilliant human being. You know, he, he basically, he didn't develop his own system of philosophy, but he, he did he did create uh, or he did find some new ways of presenting material. Um, you know, nothing's really new, but he found some, found some new ways of presenting material. And um, one of the philosophers that uh, he couldn't stand was Immanuel Kant, who wrote The Groundwork of Metaphysics of Ethics. But in his later years, the writings that he has is that, um, you know, he, he sounds a lot like Immanuel Kant in, in his writings because he talks about how important the understanding of morality and ethics are to lead a good life so that at the very end of it, you don't die with regret. That at the end of all of this, and most of the world forgets this, but it's something I reflect on every day that... At the end of all of this, we all die. Um, you know, me- memento mori, the old saying, remember that you must die. Uh, the Roman soldiers, and they, a lot of them, when they would come back from battle, the generals, they would have their slaves next to them whispering in their ears, memento mori, memento mori, remember that you must die. To, to, to keep their egos down, you know. And um, at the end of all of it, it's, you know, does does all this stuff really matter? MK Ultra, all this other stuff. Like, I mean, do we want it to perpetuate? No, but I mean, only the people in those positions that that work in those houses in the government really, really know what's going on. 
you know? So, I mean, you can try to dig through the vaults and dig through the vaults and you can look at, you know, declassified material from like 1951 and 1952. And when you read some of the stuff that the CIA was doing back then, I mean, it's, I mean, it's still more advanced than things are going on now. So the things that are happening now, I mean, we can't even imagine, you know, and the world is going to be what it's going to be. It's not saying that, you know, we shouldn't vote and fight. Obviously, you know, we should, you know, vote and stand up for our rights. Um, but it's, the question is, what do we stand up for? What is the right thing to fight for? The right thing to fight for is equality, uh, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, not to suppress other people, freedom of dialogue, you know, the right to, um, to defend yourself, the right to live. You know, we all have the right to live. And in the end, that's what matters is that when it's your time to go, that you can look back and say, I lived the best life and I was the best version of myself that I could have been. Absolutely. Yeah. And, ju and just so people are aware, uh, could you touch on the infiltration aspect just so that people that can understand kind of the dynamics going on with the separation between the Illuminati and the Freemasonry and, and all, sure. how all that went down. So uh, the main, uh, one of the main distinctions between the Illuminati and Freemasonry is that Freemasonry is a society with secrets. So we can, we're, we can say we're Freemasons, right? But the Illuminati were not allowed to say they were members of the Illuminati. That is a true secret society. You can't announce your membership into the group, right? Just like, I mean, it's kind of like the CIA. You're not really allowed to say like, hey, I work with the CIA. Um, so the, one of the, the big things was the, the infiltration of Freemasonry. So to have a secret society, there's two main things that you need. You need, you need money. And you need a member base. You need money so that you can have, uh, you know, a, you can buy a building or have a place to meet. And you need regalia and, and paraphernalia to have costumes and jewels and swords and props and working tools for your rituals and your ceremonies. But you also need a member base. So, um, you know, what better member base at the time that was booming, um, that was close to these mysteries, these mystery types of uh, initiatory rites than Freemasonry. I mean, it was, it was booming. So um, the Illuminati, with the help of uh, a high-ranking Freemason, um, infiltrated Freemasonry. And, you know, they positioned themselves as saying, like, okay, uh, once they got inside of a lodge and got a lot of Illuminati members initiated into a Masonic lodge, now you, you, they kind of take it over and then they would go to the other members and say like, Hey, there's, there's actually something on another level and it's got more secrets, you know, it's very appealing and attracted to people with that type of mindset that, that are looking for these mysteries. Like, why are we here? You know, it all goes back to those questions. So the Illuminati infiltrated Freemasonry. Um, that all came to a halt, though, you know, in the, uh, around 1783, 1784, when uh, the, uh, the leader of Bavaria at that time, uh, crea uh, he issued an, a, an edict that said that if you're a part of any secret society or any type of mystery society or initiatory society, that you would either be exiled or put to death. So um, you saw all of the groups scatter um, around the same time. You had the birth of what is now known as the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, Freemasonry, which are the higher degrees. And, um, you know, it, when, you, when you get into reading that, there are a lot of reasons why that was created. But, you know, that was brought about to preserve the teachings of a lot of the major religions because – the Illuminati wanted to remove uh, the idea of religion completely from the mystery degrees. And, you know, these mysteries come from religious traditions. And I, I have a question about that because 
I may be confused, but I, I had thought for some reason that the only viable recruitable members that Adam Weissup wanted to join, was it not a prerequisite that you had to come from a Christian background or? Well, Weissop, to become a, a member of the Illuminati, you either had to be Christian or a non-practicing Jew at the time. Okay. And, you know, a big part of, you know, I mean, and when you look at the, when you look at the Illuminati, the way it was structured as an order, you could see even though he wasn't Catholic or, you know, so he structured his, his group, his platform, you know, around a Christian structure, order, you know, uh, order of the Illuminati, Illuminati, the, the grades, these different degrees. So, you know, it's, it's, it's based off of, uh, you know, in a sense, the, the structure is Christian and Freemasonic, you know, Freemasonic, includes other religions and other philosophies but his was uh you know he definitely borrowed from the catholic church as much as uh he despised it yeah and so you mentioned the remove he there was the intention of removing the religious aspects from the system was that because he wanted it to be um what, what are your thoughts on what was were the reasons for that the reasons for that was that, well, first of all, the Illuminati, they did try to uh, infiltrate different different governments, but it wasn't to overthrow governments. It was to put people in positions of power with understandings of philosophy to make the world a better place. Because at the time, again, the, the Catholic Church, uh, the Holy See, had so much power over everything that... Um, you know, you had kings and monarchs and different governments. You know, they couldn't make a move without consulting with the Vatican. And, you know, they're just like any institution. And I'm not back the Vatican, you know, because it has, it has done wonderful things. And it's in its culture and its history as well, too. But he wanted to, he wanted to have people, he wanted to have philosopher uh, minds in government that could look at issues of morality and and political affairs from a from not just like okay let's go to war because war creates industry industry creates wealth wealth creates more jobs more jobs creates more GDP you know more GDP creates more power for the country you know he was looking at it from a sense of like what why don't we try to actually do what's right but when you try to infiltrate a government you know, with you know, spiritual or philosophical beliefs, that makes you no different than really the Vatican at that time. You know, so it becomes kind of hypocritical in a sense. If people are going to find that, they have to find that for themselves. Okay. Uh, and I want to point out to listeners, you, you actually got to visit with a living descendant of one of the original members and sift through some original documents and I don't remember if it was in the film or not, but I think you were able to see some letters between Illuminati members and John Adams and Ben Franklin, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you found any interesting correspondences in that regard that you thought would be cool to point out. I did. So they did correspond with, uh, they did correspond with John Adams. John Adams was actually very open to what, what they were trying to do is they wanted to establish a colony in America. And basically in their letter, you know, John Adams wrote back to him saying like, you know, we would love to, have, you, you know, you're welcome here. We respect freedom of religion. Whereas George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, you know, are very much opposed to it because I, I don't know, I don't know why, but they, they were, but John Adams was very open to them coming over here because John Adams was, you know, he was a very firm believer in, you know, freedom of religion, freedom of thought. And, uh, but the Illuminati never, none of the members uh, had ever made it over to establish that colony, which would have been in the South. Um, they were calling Elysium. And uh, it was basically swamp land they were looking at, and they just didn't have the money to do it. So, yeah. but it was interesting seeing the correspondence for sure. Um, 
Are you able to discuss any of the family traditions that are carried on by the family of the descendant or those kind of private traditions or I can't really speak to that. I just, because I don't, I don't know enough to speak to it. Um, I know the families, the descendants, uh, they, they recognize each other. You know, when I was, when I was at one of the castles looking at the documents, um, uh, you know, I, I had, I had talked great length with the Baron, uh, about his, you know, great, 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 however many great grandfather. And, he, you know, they just had, you know, they, they respected his traditions. You know, they brought down a box of his Masonic regalia from the 1700s. They bought, and within the box were, were his rituals of the Illuminati. You know, it was pretty, pretty, um, mind blowing to, to have my hands on those things and to see that. Um, but to also understand that, you know, these, that he was a man of, uh, and we're talking about this ancestor. He was a man of, um, you know, he loved his country and he, he loved knowledge and that was a passion of his. And, um, the family was a very, very amazing family. And, uh, you know, I know the letters, the modern letters of correspondence I'd seen between some of the um, ancestors. That, you know, uh, you know, they would say like, "Oh, we found uh, some more stuff from ancestor Vysop's uh, stuff or ancestor Kaniga's stuff." You know, uh, do you want to take a look at it? You know, it's basic kind of correspondence like that. Um, I heard you mention this is just. Uh, switching gears a little bit, I heard you mention in a previous interview uh, gematria, and I wanted to ask you about that and see if you could give a, a little overview of what what exactly is gematria. Um, well, gematria is basically a type of it's a type of cipher, and the idea is that in Kabbalah and in Hebrew, it, it basically it numerates it creates numer numerical values for for Hebrew words, and uh, it, which is tied in with Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalistic learnings. It, it's really uh, in Freemasonry. You know, there's there's a lot of emphasis on elements of Kabbalistic teachings uh, for the purpose of inculcating morality into the initiates. But as far as you know, Gematria itself that that is something like where someone would you know, find that of interest and say like, oh, you know, it's interesting that this, these words uh, translate into these numbers and, you know, Hebrew scholars of, uh, you know, the Kabbalah, uh, the, you know, they believe that there are hidden texts, you know, in, uh, in the Torah. So that lends itself more, more into that world. I have found some interesting things when I've looked at you know, secret words that we have in Freemasonry, especially in the higher degrees in the Scottish Rite, the n numerical values they they uh, translate to, and and the and the the positions of geometrical figures that they create. Now, that could be just something that um, is coincidence, or or maybe not. But, but there's nothing that I've seen, you know, where it's written that like there is a there's this deep rooted. Um, secret path working in it like they're like these kabbalistic researchers are using gamashia for for you know the torah yeah it's really fascinating to me um other thing i wanted to ask you was in terms of like all of the different degrees and the rituals that you've been a part of i was wondering if there's one in particular that has been that stood out to you or been more impactful or just kind of hit you in a particular way that you think might be of value to elaborate on for the listeners? You know, I, I, I would, if you asked me that a few years ago, I would have given you an answer about a particular degree, but now my understanding has, has grown to the point where I see it as an entire system. So, you know, it's kind of like having like a, you know, like if you hand build a hot rod car, you know, or a motorcycle, you know, it's like, and you build it, you make the thing and it's just beautiful, you know, you know, kind of car or motorcycle or whatever it is that you make. 
I look at it as a whole. So like the, it's the whole thing. Um, like I don't, I wouldn't just say like, Oh, I like the carburetor or the muffler on it. You know, it's my favorite part of the car. It's like, no, it's like the whole thing because it's a whole system that works together. So, um, you know, my favorite aspects of it are just, uh, you know, just there, there's so many mysteries that are presented in it that it's a lifetime of speculation uh, and research that you can dive into that, um, you know, that can give you, you know, things that, you know, they're, they're there in the Bible, they're there in the Torah, they're there in the Bhagavad Gita, they're there in uh, uh, the Quran, they're in, they're in all the holy books. It's, there's nothing that's really hidden. But it's just the way that it's presented with the pageantry and the ceremonial aspects and the rituals that uh, it's very beautiful. And, you know, there's there's a part of a degree where it, it talks about one of the higher degrees. And I'm talking about when I say higher, I mean, after the number three, the Master Mason degree. And it doesn't mean that they're they are higher than the Master Mason degree. But they just expand on these first three degrees. But there's a degree it talks about, you know. You, where you get to a point where it says like, if you're now, if you're no, if you're still just interested in the mere ceremony and pageantry of masonry, it's time for you to stop and to, to, to go deeper, to go beneath the surface. And that's saying to look within yourself because there's something within you that's still not rectified. There are things within you that you're still not facing. Wow. I love that. All right. I wanted to ask you about the vaults of Enoch and the crypts of Solomon. And just to kind of get you to elaborate on that, because I heard you mention it and it seemed really interesting. Yeah. Well, part of the mythos is that, um, you know, a lot of Freemasonry revolves around the building of King Solomon's temple. And, uh, you know, again, all this stuff's all in the Bible. You know, do we know for a fact if there were these crypts and vaults? No, but um, uh, someone once told me, in masonry that uh, it doesn't matter whether or not a story is true. It matters what you take out of it. And when you look at sort of like the symbolism um, of these crypts and vaults, you know, one goes horizontal, so left to right, and one goes up and down. And one represents a material aspect of life. So your job, your wealth, your, the things that you do as a physical human being, while the other represents the line of ascension or descension of your spirituality. And at the, uh, the, the crossing point of them forms the cross. And at that middle point, um, when you are in balance with yourself and you find yourself, there is what's called the blooming of the rose or the rosy cross, the ro rosa croix. And that's the point of life is to have that rose bloom within. That's your spirituality. You become a healer, you become a teacher, you become a magician, in a sense. You become someone that we all have it in us. We all have, we all have the ability to, to carry that purpose on earth, but that is our purpose. And uh, again, it doesn't matter what religion you are, but some of the most profound words ever spoken you know, were by... Um, by Christ talking about forgiveness. You have to be able to forgive yourself. You have to be able to ask for forgiveness. You know, the Buddha, uh, uh, Muhammad, I mean, all of these prophets had amazing things to say. And Dr. Tresner, uh, to quote him from, you know, 33 and beyond, uh, to close with like, the, we're talking about the vaults and the crypts, you know, buried deep down within the self is, uh, what we refer to as like this cubicle stone that's your true self so your job is to go all the way down into your into your true being and you you find the, that when you can open that and you have the courage to open that and you face all of these kind of you know you could refer to them as angels and demons in yourself but when you when you face yourself and you come face to face uh then that that box opens the light bursts out and you now have a higher purpose, which is that you're a disciple of light. You're a soldier of the flame. You are um, a master or a keeper of the gates of the Holy Empire. 
And that's what constitutes true change in the world is that you change yourself first. You, you, you obtain mastery of yourself. And by doing that through your actions, you will inspire others to do the same. And that spark becomes a fire and that fire starts to blaze and shine a lighter on the entire world. And that is the, the goal of that. I love that. I, I don't know the current state of you know, lodge membership or anything like that, but my spidey senses tell me that much like we're seeing now this kind of resurgence within like the art of alchemy and so on and the esoteric in general, I think that it's going to kind of be mirrored within Freemasonry as well, especially during this particular moment in society where it, it seems so many individuals are kind of lost at sea and seeking a deeper and you know more meaningful experience to engage and develop themselves. I mean, we're kind of in a time of a great like social epidemic where the behavioral development, the behavioral developmental needs aren't necessarily being met in a sustainable way. And I, I could definitely see value in engaging in something such as Freemasonry, um, just from speaking to you and watching your films and as far as my understanding is so far. Um, I wanted to ask you if you have anything coming down the pipe as far as anything new that you're working on, any projects that you want to throw out there for the listeners. Yeah, there's a, a TV series we just finished filming. The working title of it right now is Occult America. That's subject to change. It, it depends on what happens with it. We're in post-production on it. And uh, the idea that I had when I, I created this was that I wanted to do a psychological investigation into these different esoteric and occult traditions that are still practiced in you know America today. So everything from Hermeticism to Rosicrucianism to voodoo to spiritualism to Freemasonry to witchcraft to Satanism, looking at, you know, there is a, there, there's an occult revival happening in America and people are going to these ancient traditions and esoteric traditions. So, you know, something like Satanism, you know, Levian Satanism, as people call it, but, uh, you know, which was, you know, started in the you know, 1960s by Anton LaVey, um, like that's not ancient. Uh, that is esoteric, though, in a sense. It's a philosophy. And then you look on the other side of the spectrum, like Hermeticism, which is ancient. Uh, this goes back to ancient Egypt and Greece and these teachings. Um, you know, there, there's a common commonality that runs through all of them, which is that uh, people are looking for balance. People are looking for a way to not only heal themselves, but to heal the world, to do their part. They're realizing that there's more to life than just getting up and going to work every day and you know, being uh, uncivil on the internet with people that don't think and uh, agree with them or think exactly like them, you know. There's an awakening happening, and um, you know who knows. I mean, as horrible as the pandemic is, and all the people that we've lost through it, it could be. You know, I, nature doesn't make mistakes, and you know whether the you know this virus was made in a laboratory or whatever, and released on the earth. Um, once once it is released, it's up to nature how nature carries this thing, right? And nature doesn't make mistakes so during this time period of you know this these hardships that we've all been through my interests lie in bringing to light these esoteric and ancient traditions that might create a spark within somebody that is in in a small town where maybe there's only one church and a you know, if, 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 that, if that's their calling, that's their calling. There's nothing wrong with that. But just to let them know that there is so much more to the world to take a look at, even just to read about, to study, to learn about each other, to learn about the history of the human race, that since the dawn of the thinking human, civil, human being from so the beginning of civilization, that we've been wondering and searching for answers to these mysteries. And 
in the end, it doesn't matter if you if you find the answers to these things. You know, we're not going to find you know these answers to like, well, why why is there death? You know, like you know, there's all these different theories on it. Like, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that you speculate on it, that you accept that it's going to happen, that you live a good life, that you do the best that you can do while you're here to make the world a better place. But you make it to make it better than how you. You, you leave it better than how you entered it. That's all that matters. Amen to that. Uh, that was a beautiful uh, note. Um, is there any any other last messages that you want to leave the audience on um, before we kind of you know, put out your any, no, any last I, I, I would just say that uh, God be with you all and stay safe, keep an open mind, and love one another. It's all about love. Beautiful. And is there any um, anywhere that you would direct individuals if they want to learn more about the things that you've got going on or learn more about you? Is there any any particular links or anything like that that you want to put out there? Amazon Prime has both of the films that we were talking about, 33 and Beyond and Illuminated, and um, uh, on imdb.com, which is the, uh, the movie database. Um, if they search my name, you can see the projects that we have coming up so awesome all right well this was amazing and just want to extend my gratitude and appreciation again for you coming on and having this discussion with me um so thank you and have a good night yeah thank you sky and uh shout out to tj for connecting us so yes indeed shout out tj <laughs> all right, all right.